McQuistion, talking about things that matter with people who care. Production of McQuistion is made possible in part by individual viewers, the Hatton W. Sumner's Foundation for the Study of Teaching and Self-Government, Hillcrest Foundation founded by Mrs. W. W. Carruth Sr., CF & Company LLP, serving Dallas-Fort Worth and the Southwest since 1956, and Sundown Ranch, providers of comprehensive and co-occurring disorder treatment to adolescents and young adults. Last month, I had the pleasure of meeting Herb Meyer at a Washington Bankers Association meeting in Seattle, Washington, which is where Herb Meyer lives. He's a former CIA employee in the Reagan administration, and Herb is extremely concerned that Western civilization is facing three major challenges to its very survival. We're going to hear from him and what those challenges are, and let me tell you a bit about him. As I said, he was in the Reagan administration as a special assistant to the director of the CIA and vice chairman of the CIA's National Intelligence Council. He managed production of the U.S. National Intelligence Estimates and other top secret projections for the President and the National Security Advisors. He is widely credited with being the first senior U.S. government official to forecast the collapse of the Soviet Union, a forecast for which he later was awarded the U.S. National Intelligence Distinguished Service Medal, which is the intelligence community's highest honor. Uh, Herb, you were formerly uh, an associate editor at Fortune. You've written several books, including one called The War Against Progress, uh, Real World Intelligence and Hard Thinking. Of course, this is a DVD that you have called The Siege of Western Civilization. So first of all, tell us what those three challenges are. Western civilization is under attack from the war itself, the attack by radical Islam or extreme jihadism, whatever you wish to call it, on the West. We're also in trouble because of our own demographic problems. We've stopped breeding, quite literally. The birth rates are now below the replacement level in most countries. That's a very serious threat. And finally, here in the United States, we're in the middle of what amounts to be a second civil war, the cultural war that we talk about. Those are three threats. One's external, two are internal, if you will, and they're all quite serious. All right. Now, one of the things that I was particularly impressed with when I heard you speak uh, last month, it was after the program that I was doing out there, and I was had the luxury of sitting around and listening to you, I'm happy to say, is that you talked about, first of all, what Western civilization is. And for that viewer uh, who may or may not have had the opportunity to study a course in Western civilization in college, or like me, it's been a few years since we've been in college and probably have forgotten which college we were in, much less what the definition of Western civilization is. Give us some sense of what the war is against when you say Western civilization. When you study history, it's really the story of competing operating systems. And if there's one thing we all understand these days, it's competing operating systems. And when operating systems collide in the marketplace, things can get very nasty very quickly. But there are no tanks. Microsoft and Apple work it out. In politics, there really are tanks. And when one operating system attacks the other, that's war. That's the definition of a war. Our operating system is Western civilization. It started with the Greeks, but it took off in Europe in the 15th and 16th centuries when Judaism and Christianity reconciled with the modern world. The rabbis, the priests, the scholars, they, they worked it out. They paved the way forward. By the way, that ignited the scientific revolution. It triggered the greatest explosion of art literature and music the world's ever known. Shakespeare, Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, Bach. Here's what Western civilization is. The individual is at the center of it. Church and state are separate. It's the rule of law, the idea of property rights, economic liberty, individual rights, human rights, women's rights. In Western civilization, we unleash the entrepreneurial talents of our people. We encourage intellectual curiosity. It's an endless struggle for equality among the races and the sexes, not always successful. Is Western civilization perfect? No, couldn't be. It's designed and operated by human beings, but it's the modern world itself, All right, now when and you that's say, us. Okay, when you say Western civilization, give me an idea, and you, you'll add to what you just said in just a minute, but give me an idea of uh, geography in there, or is it just um, sort of an operating system that could exist anywhere? Could exist anywhere. It's the United States, Canada, Europe, Japan is part of Western civilization. More and more Asian countries are joining Western civilization. 
to a real extent, it's the modern world. Anybody who accepts those principles, you're in Western civilization. And it really seems to be the operating system that most people find works best. Okay. And what you're seeing when you look at the war is an attempt by another operating system to knock us off. Okay, and those other operating systems include radical Well, World Islam. War II, we had fascism. That was an operating system. Uh, the Cold War was the Soviet communist operating system. Now the threat comes from radical Islam or extreme jihadism. You can use any combination of phrases you want. Them. In that operating system, as these extremists see it, the individual is not at the center of it. Church and state are not separate. It's combined. It's a political as well as a religious operating system. The individual is subservient to it, and you do not have the option to opt out. That system does not unleash the entrepreneurial talents of its people. It discourages intellectual curiosity. By the way, this is one of the great tra tragedies of human history. The Muslims are geniuses. They invented algebra. That's an Arabic word. They invented the concept of the zero. They virtually invented the science of medicine. If you spend a thousand years crushing intellectual curiosity, you don't get new medicines, you don't get new vaccines, new technologies. That all this genius has been lost to the human race is an incalculable tragedy. And in this extreme operating system, women are treated as though they were property rather than people. Very simply put, it's incompatible with the modern world, and that's the glitch. All right. Now, when you say radical Islam or Islamic Jihad, let me, let me be clear for that viewer, because um, I interviewed a guy named Fawaz Gurdjieff last year. I wrote a book called The Journey of the Jihadists. I don't know if you know him or have read his book, but basically he says that there's a small percentage of, of people who comprise what he was calling the jihadist, and then he said there's a larger percentage called the Islamist, and there's everybody else who sort of you know, practices and all that, mm -hmm. but they are, you know, acclimated to the modern world, so to speak. Uh, what are we talking about in terms of a percentage, or is it a, just an idea, or are we talking about Al-Qaeda, are we talking about uh, uh, various other groups that, are, uh, that use terror as a weapon? Who are we talking about? Well, it, it, it's a good question for which there isn't a very precise answer. It's them. Look, human nature doesn't change. Most human beings are very decent people. They just want to go about their business, raise their kids, live quietly, and not cause trouble. Most Germans weren't Nazis. Most Russians weren't communists. But when the creeps are in charge, you have a real problem. Most Muslim people are the most wonderful people you'd ever want to meet. Be lucky to have them as your neighbors. But you get a percentage of them. It would include Al-Qaeda. It would include the Taliban. It would include that whole alphabet soup of radical groups that you can never remember because it changes every time you pick up the paper. It's them. So it isn't Islam, in a sense. It's the radical part of it. In a, in a way, there is a civil war within Islam itself between the radicals and the moderates, who are the overwhelming majority. And we've been caught up in their civil war. It's now spilling over and hitting us. And that's the problem for us. If it was contained within their own societies, it could be a very great tragedy for them, but it's got nothing to do with us. But now they're coming after us, and so we get involved. Okay. Um, there are a lot of people who would say that we have done a good thing by going into Iraq. A lot of people would say we've done a bad thing by going into Iraq. Uh, I don't know that you have an opinion on that one way or the other, but how does it play into were we reacting to what we saw, or did we cause some of that, or we made things worse by going there? Well, honorable people can disagree about whether we should have gone into Iraq, how we're doing this, and that's another conversation for another time. The point is this. When you're under attack, we were hit on September 11, and that wasn't the first attack. It was sort of the last one that made us notice we were in. The problem is you cannot just play defense. When you play defense, you lose. You have to win 100% of the time when you play defense, and you can't. If we had a perfect CIA, it would stop 25 out of 26 terrorist attacks. That's great, except you're dead. The 26th attack killed you. So what do you do? 